so we'll just uh, keep uh, pushing forward uh, with with this uh, with this show as it is. <laughs> Uh, I, I apologize for the uh, technical glitches while I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. But uh, in the meantime, um, let's uh, let's see if we can uh, move on and um, talk about the uh, the big uh, bombshell news that uh, hit the hit the internet um, last night and uh, this morning that people have been exploding over, which is uh, that J.K. Rowling has said that she um, doesn't like, she regrets um, the relationship between uh, Ron and Hermione. And she said that it was something of wish fulfillment on her part and that it was more of an indulgence than something that worked narratively. Uh, and I was wondering what uh, some of you out there thought about this. Um, I, for one, never had a problem with the Ron and Hermione um, relationship. I thought it was just fine. Um, it never felt forced to me. Uh, I thought it had a, a nice progression, a little bit of a, an anticlimactic payoff, um, at least uh, for when they finally uh, got together. But, you know, that's just me. But, um, yeah, I didn't really have a problem with, um, with Ron and Hermione's relationship. Uh, I did, however, have much more of a problem with the, uh, epilogue of, uh, Deathly Hallows. And I know that I'm probably in the minority on this, uh, because I know a lot of people uh actually really like this epilogue but for me it felt like it was too too much wish fulfillment <laughs> um um so i'm just looking at the comments here never read the potter books or saw the movie so i have no idea <laughs> that's okay light of the king uh Temple is saying, I don't have a problem either way. I don't feel like it's big enough in the books that it's a, that it's a big part of my experience of Harry Potter. And you know what? That's a very good point, Temple. Like, it was a... Uh, I mean, the, the book series is called Harry Potter, not Ron and Hermione's weird relationship. Um, but as far as the, the epilogue of Deathly Hallows go, I sort of felt like... The only, the only positive, the only plot narrative thing that I got out of that epilogue was seeing that despite everything that Harry went through, he still ended up living a pretty, a pretty simple life and a, a good life, a stable one as a, as a husband and a father. And that like, even though you can spend your entire adolescence having the entire weight of the world on your shoulders once it's over you can go and live a regular normal life and that i kind of liked um as for the other stuff it felt like it was sort of like just going down the list of like this person ended up with this person this person ended up with this person this person ended up with this person and it got it got kind of tedious and unnecessary for me but that's just me um, but yeah, I sort of felt like uh, the Ron and Hermione relationship was fine. Uh, I never minded it. Um, I could uh, understand uh, Rowling's um, regret of it because there might have been a bit too much focus put on that and that might have been maybe from her or from fans going, I want to see Ron and Hermione get together because it's been hinted at for so long. Um, but I do sort of feel like if she had gone the other way and if Harry and Hermione had gotten together, uh, it would have been even worse. Um, I never liked the idea of the two of them getting together. And quite frankly, I didn't feel like the story needed any kind of romance subplot. And I felt like all the, all the romance stuff sort of took away from the bigger story. But... Again, that's just me. Um, I'm one of those people who feels that um, a romantic subplot in a story doesn't really 
should serve the greater story and not be an end to itself. Um, let's see. Jan is saying, at least for the movies, I think the relationship made very good sense. There were hints even in the early movies, I remember in the third one, that Ron holds Hermione's hand when Harry is riding the hippogriff. Yeah. Um, and Temple says Harry and Hermione would have been too predictable. And uh, yeah, I agree. It's like, it would have been predictable. It also would have been cliched. Um, and so I guess that's kind of why I liked that uh, there was this buildup of Ron and Hermione. Um, but yeah. So I, I never really cared either way. Um, it is interesting to uh, see that Rowling didn't like it. And what's even more interesting is to see a lot of the backlash she's been getting over the last day or so about this. Um, a lot of my friends uh, on Facebook and on Twitter, and I realize that's not a huge cross-section of the population, um, a lot of them have been quite angry about this uh about this announcement um and because i guess they really identified with uh ron and hermione as a as a couple and they felt like this this was a really important thing and you know everybody um interprets uh, stories differently and everybody latches on to different things differently um and so I don't really, I, I can understand why people might take offense at what Rowling had said, uh, just because it's, uh, it's what, it goes against what they build up in their head. And, you know, I totally understand that. But, you know, at the same time, uh, Temple is saying uh, it's her creation and it's her right to critique her own work, and absolutely it is. Um, and I totally agree that it's uh, it's totally her creation. And if she didn't like the way something uh, came out, then that's totally her prerogative. And I I respect her for that. Um, and Temple is now saying, plus she had a tight schedule to keep with getting her books out. It doesn't surprise me that she might have put some things in that she'd have taken out if she'd had more time to think about it. And that's very true. She had a she had quite a a bit of pressure from uh, the studio to keep pace with uh, the books, so that the books could keep pace with the movies. And and. Uh, like, I mean, I know she had a lot of uh, creative control as far as uh, the books and the movies and everything goes, but at the same time, you wanted to get out a movie a year, which meant you needed to be at least a few books ahead of the movies, and in order to do that, you needed to really be on it. And now, uh, George R. R. Martin is going through the, uh, the same problem with uh, Game of Thrones, and he said... Uh, uh, quite publicly a couple of times that he's worried the show is going to catch up to the books before he has time to finish them. Um, so, uh, and Jan is uh, recommending uh, the books to uh, Light of the King because uh, apparently she hasn't read them and that's totally fine. Um, uh, he does say the books are just as good as the movies. That I don't totally agree with. Um, I I felt like uh, there are, there are strong movies in the series and there are weak movies in the series. Um, uh, my my favorite movie of the whole series is still uh, Prisoner of Azkaban um, because it was the most creative and also was the first one that like really kind of looked at these characters as characters and not as set pieces like they kind of were treated like in the first two movies uh so so yeah that those are my thoughts on uh on harry potter and uh Uh, Light of the King is saying, I just have not been a reader up until this year. And then the movies, they seem sort of teenager. What do you, or teenagey? What do you think? Um, the movies are, uh, especially the first two, are definitely very uh, kiddie. Um, I felt that uh, the third one, uh, Prisoner of Azkaban, 
uh, definitely tried to mature it up more and make it more creative and more um, visually interesting and and to give the characters themselves uh, a bit more depth um, beyond that it's kind of hit or miss with uh, some of them uh, Gobble to Fire I felt was too rushed um, Order of the Phoenix uh, same deal I felt it was too rushed um, Half Blood Prince I I'll be honest uh, Half Blood Prince I never cared too much about the book or the movie it always felt like a bridge to me like it felt like uh, we're just going to use this story to get from where we ended uh, Order of the Phoenix to where we can finally get into the end game in uh, Deathly Hallows. So a lot of it felt like it was kind of biding its time. Like there was there was nothing like offensive or boring about it. I just felt like um, there was a, a review a while ago about the movie um, that said basically. If you're not into the series at this point, this movie's not going to help you. And that's uh, that's kind of how I felt about uh, Half Blood Prince. And then uh, the Deathly Hallows, uh, the final one. Um, I in, I thought it was a good climax. Um, it was not the most satisfying one for all of uh, the buildup that had happened, but I thought it was perfectly fine. Um, uh, I, I thought it gave a, a good ending to the story. Uh, the epilogue I felt uh, was a tad unnecessary, but you know, overall, like I mean, I've only ever read through uh, the books as a series uh, once. Um, I think I've read a couple of them, maybe more than once, but as a whole, uh, I've only read the entire thing once, and that was uh, when the movies were coming out. So that's a couple of years ago now at this point. Um, so it's not as fresh in my mind, but um, I, I remember liking it. Um, I went to a number of uh, the midnight uh, book releases. I think I went to every midnight book release starting at a Goblet of Fire. <laughs> so I, back in the days of uh, Borders, God, I miss Borders. I loved that store. Um, so I would always go to uh, the midnight releases there. Uh, so, so yeah, just kind of sad about now. Now I'm getting all misty-eyed about missing borders. God, <laughs> those were some darn good bookstores. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, that's Harry Potter. Uh, that's a uh, Rowling's uh, announcement. So um. Let's uh, let's uh, speed through some stuff here. Um, we uh, have um, the the what's it uh, the rewrite Tolkien contest, um, and uh, yeah, now everybody's uh, saying how much they miss Borders, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, so our rewrite Tolkien contest uh, ended uh, last week. Uh, for January and our January contest was uh, The Hobbit written as uh, newspaper articles and I know and I made the promise uh, last month that I would read the winner on the air as uh, in the voice of one of those old-timey 1940s newsreel announcers and I am going to stick to that and I will do that for our winner um, but since we don't have uh, graphics right now I'm going to skip ahead to let you know what the uh, theme for February is going to be. Uh, since February is Valentine's and there is uh, romance and love in the air, uh, we figured who better to bring into the rewrite Tolkien fold who uh, who has a nice uh, romantic uh, sort of sense to her than Jane Austen. So February is going to be uh, The Hobbit, written by Jane Austen. Uh, I would put up a graphic for that, but I don't have one right now. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, it's gonna be a it's gonna be Jane Austen. Um, we do ask that um, 
you keep your entries uh, PG rated. Um, we do know that there are lots of people who love uh, who love romance and love their fic out there, and they love to uh, get kind of graphic. Um, please don't uh, try to keep it nice. <laughs> and and now we've got yay jane austen yes so uh th this one uh this one can be a lot of fun um i might even uh see if i can talk uh, one of my uh lady uh voice actor friends to uh come on and uh read the entry <laughs> well a ranger must be in want of an elf wife <laughs> nice <laughs> so uh Uh, so Jan is saying he's getting a country error. Where are you guys from? Well, I'm from LA and I'm broadcasting through LA, I believe. I think that's where the server is located. So, um, yeah, not sure what's going on with, uh, your country error, Jan. I am sorry. So let me go and bring up give me one second here I'm just uh, bringing up the uh, the winning entry which I probably should have done before the show, but I was dealing with all those weird technical issues, so now we'll just scroll through all the entries to find it. We got a lot of entries this month. It's gotta be around here. Ah, here it is. Okay. So let me just check in with the chat here. Huh. I'm I'm sorry that uh you're getting these weird errors, Jan. Uh and that it's saying it wants you to buy a pro account. That's that's kinda lame. So, all right, well, I'm going to go over to our rewrite token entries because we're now already almost 35 minutes into the show. So we should win, we should read our winning entry. Um, our winning entry is, uh, is an entry from the Lake Town Post uh, that was written by, uh, I'm, so sorry, I know I'm going to get this. I'm, not, I'm going to mispronounce this name. Uh, Sani Kanta Oska from Finland. Um, and the uh, the fake uh, or the uh, fictional uh, newspaper that she is writing from is called the Lake Town Post. So let us begin here with uh, with our article. Dun da da da. <clears throat> Lake Town welcomes Thorin Oakenshield. The heir of Durin has arrived in Lake Town and promises to bring wealth back to the city. Thorin Oakenshield, the leader of the company consisting of 13 dwarves and one hobbit, arrived in Lake Town in the autumn of TA 2941. The visit has been cited as historical for the purposes of the party's quest is to reclaim Erebor, which has been conquered by the dragon Smaug. The company sought the master of Lake Town and claimed Thorin the king under the mountain. The news was greeted warmly by the master as Thorin promised to grant a, a part of the treasure of Erebor to the people of Lake Town. This is really good news to us, the master told the post. All our people have suffered from hunger and poverty, but now we can put an end to all of our troubles. The king under the mountain has promised to donate us, to donate us, say, a big a big amount of money and riches. 
The citizens of Lake Town know very well songs of the king under the mountain who comes to who comes to take back his kingdom and consequently brings better uh, brings a better standard of living to the city. The background of these prophecies remains unknown and there is no evidence about their reliability, but the inhabitants seem to be positive and confident. I have three children to feed and my house leaks as there is a big hole in the roof. Ingrid from the Western Lake Town from the Western Lake Town says to the post, "No one comes to repair the roof as I can as I really don't have anything to pay them, but if the legends are true and we are about to become richer we than we've ever dreamed, then there is nothing to worry about. My children will be able to eat as much as they want, and we won't have to suffer from the leaking roof anymore. However, there are some who remain skeptical. In spite of the prophecies, I do not think it's wise to go near the mountain, remarked Bard, a father of one son. I think these are things that are supposed to be left alone. They are not for us. The grim archer considers the whole quest as doomed as a doomed trial. If they, the dwarves, wake the dragon sleeping inside the mountain, then we will all be destroyed. The master doesn't seem to be too worried about the question whether the trial of the imp whether the trial of the improvident dwarves and a hobbit who has been described as an official burglar will share opinions among the inhabitants there will be oppos there will be some opposing of course as there always is the master said mysteriously but i think that will end as soon as everyone gets their share of the treasure that will silence the rest of the doubters According to an assistant of the master, the company will stay close. To, will stay cl will stay at the town for two weeks. They will be taken good care of, as the city officers as the ugh, as the city offers them food and warm bed, so that they can rest before the undoubtedly most dangerous part of their quest. The company will be expected to leave in two weeks. So, there it is. Uh, that was our our winning entry from uh, from Sonny from uh, the return of, from the rewrite Tolkien uh, January contest, and so February is going to be Jane Austen, and so now we have our January book of the month, which is Pawn of Prophecy by David Eddings. Um, I don't know how many of you have a uh, have read the book. Uh, I I've read it before, and I, I read it again. Finished it up uh, last night, just so I had it uh, fresh in my mind for uh, for the discussion today. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about um, this uh, about this story. This is clearly the first part of uh, a much bigger series. This is the first of uh, five books in the series, uh, the Belgariad. Uh, uh, Temple says I have a few thoughts on the book based on last book club uh, I'd love to hear them just go ahead and start uh, ripping away um, this was uh, the establishment story um, and the reason I chose this one uh, was particularly because it was about world building and about establishment and exposition and I felt that this one while not having much of a story unto itself, um, really helped to establish a new mythical world for people to uh, to get involved in. Um, what I liked uh, the most about this was that it really kind of laid out the history uh, that was relevant to the story um, uh, pretty quickly in um, pretty much what is just a seven-page uh, prologue. Uh, that talks about um, the gods, the creation of the world, um, uh, there was a, a discussion of um, why uh, the god Torak uh, became so evil. Now, um, for brevity's sake, uh, we'll focus just on uh, two of the seven main gods, and that's uh, Aldor and Torak. Now, while all the gods are creating um, their own species and their own peoples, uh, 
Uh, let's see, Temple is saying, I find it interesting that a common theme in fantasy is to have a character who starts out being innocent and unknowing about what's going on. Uh, yeah, there usually is a lot of that, and that's a, it is a rather common trope. Um, and... Oh, I stole the one ring is leaving. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I stole the one ring. What happened? Okay, so um, Temple is saying I think it actually helps with world building to have someone to pretty much play the reader and ask questions. That's very true. Um, uh, okay, oh, I'm sorry to hear that I Stole the One Ring is having problems with, uh, with the Justin TV broadcast. Um, well, um, so I guess we can, yeah, yeah, we'll need to, uh, discuss, uh, the Justin TV issues, uh, amongst, uh, some staffers. <laughs> so, um, anyway, with, uh, With regards to um, world building and establishment, um, we uh, we have um, we have we have like a, a really good establishment of a world here. And sorry, I got distracted. We were talking about the uh, the prologue. Um, what's so interesting about this uh, story? Um, what's so interesting about this story is um, the prologue really does uh, really does help to set things up really quickly. We've got um, we've got a lot of uh, different gods who are creating uh, their different peoples and their different nations, but uh, the two that are really focused on the most are uh, Aldor and uh, Torak. And uh, what's so interesting about those two is uh, Aldor is uh, he's a very isolationist uh, kind of god. He just wants to uh, sort of be by himself and um, and explore nature and how the world works. Uh, meanwhile you have uh, Torak who is very vain, um, likes to uh, have the best of everything, and so when Aldor uh, starts combining all of his abilities and all the natural wonders of the world into this uh, singular orb, um, Torak wants it. And from that, we get this uh, very protracted war that splits the world in half, um, and then ultimately uh, Torak goes from being just like a very vapid vain god into somebody who is now out for vengeance because of uh, how badly the orb uh, wounded him um, Light of the King is saying thought Eddings did well with the prologue and world creation even sections of the book named after the areas they traveled in uh, and the the orb was interesting. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> I mean the orb is like pretty much like the MacGuffin of the whole story. Like 
um, one of the one of my criticisms of this book is um, there are many things that are uh, that are telegraphed very uh, blatantly to just about every everybody who's reading it and yet it takes a very long time for the characters themselves to reach to discover the things that we've already figured out like for instance uh garion is the descendant of the riven king uh that was pretty obvious from the get-go um that aunt paul is the ancient with is the ancient sorceress polgara that the uh, old storyteller named wolf is the old sorcerer belgarath um that the thing that they're trying to find is in fact the orb um uh and these were these are all things that i sort of felt like they were very like it was very obvious to me and so for a lot of the time i'm reading the book i'm like come on why haven't you figured this out yet um especially with uh belgarath uh telling a lot of uh the stories about um how the how the orb how the world came into being and the battle for the orb and everything so it it becomes a little bit frustrating when uh the main characters in your story are in the story you're reading aren't figuring things out as quickly as you are so i i sort of felt like maybe not having that entire story right there in the prologue might have given us a little bit more mystery and like having the story of Torak and Aldor and the orb sort of come out little by little um, as the story progresses so that we the readers are learning it along with Garion. Uh, that that was my only real criticism of the book um, and I do like how it ends with um, Belgarath uh, talking to Garion about uh, magic and basically giving him his first uh, basic lesson in the use of magic which is essentially the concept of the will and the word um, and this is this is a cool uh, concept with uh, with magic which I've seen in uh, some other books like uh, the Dresden Files where um, the idea of um, uh, magic comes from within and that it's it takes a force of will to create it and the word is more like a trigger than an actual like this is a magic sacred word that only only the wisest of sages can know like it basically comes down to using any word helps you to focus that will and make the magic happen and so it, it, I always liked it because it felt like it was a very physical act um, rather than something mystical um, and that's something that I really like about magic and that's why um, I like uh, the Dresden Files so much because it does sort of the same thing uh, with with magic um, Temple is saying I was a little bothered that they were keeping Garion in the dark so much most of what he wanted to know wasn't exactly dangerous for him to know and that's that's a good point Temple and that that one did bother me too was just how much they were keeping from Garion, especially when it's this crucial information that he probably should know now there is like um a little they kind of allude to it at the towards the end of the first book and they play it up more in the, the later books which is that if they talk about the orb openly then it causes the enemy or um, the Grolin priests who work for uh, who work for Torak to uh, to sort of focus in on them and find Garion. So it's not so much that they're keeping they're keeping him in the dark because he can't handle the information. It's that if he knows it, the enemy will be able to find him. At least that's that's uh, sort of the way I saw it. Like it, 
it doesn't really like come into play until much later and they only allude to it a little bit towards the end of uh, this first book so I, I understand that frustration because it is like these are things Garion really should know um, he should really know like his inheritance he should know his lineage what he's going to be expected to do because uh I mean, he has a very big destiny, and you're right, to keep him in the dark about it like that is not really productive. But, you know, eventually, like, he does he does get brought into the fold, he's told everything, he accepts his fate, and does the deed. So... Um, and then, like, but this is something that Eddings does a lot with, like, this whole idea of um, knowledge or telling people information as being this sort of, um, this sort of way in. Like, another, another uh, example of that is how uh, the, the big bad for this story, uh, Asherak, uh, put some sort of spell on Garion so that he is physically incapable of telling anybody about Asherak. Like, he can, he can sort of get close to telling people about him, or he can ask questions, but whenever it comes to a point where he is like, hey, there is this guy who is, who has been stalking me my entire life, and I'm pretty sure he's a bad guy, uh, he physically seizes up and can't do it. And, I would say for like maybe the first half of the book, it's sort of it sort of feels like this is just him being stubborn, but then like as you get further into it, you realize like no, there is something holding him back from from telling the people who need to know this um what is happening. And so I sort of felt like uh that that's an interesting idea. Um and I mean, like the whole idea of um, like knowledge is power is not a new one. Um, but I, I like how this idea of creating knowledge and making it like physically powerful, like just the fact that you know something uh, can give people an advantage over you or can give you um, a strong advantage over that. And then, and Light of the King is saying, and then Aunt Paul had to magically pull the Asherak name out of him. Yeah, and it really, like, took a lot out of him for her to do that. And so, like, this whole idea of knowledge being power is uh, very strong in these books. And and I do like that. And I sort of feel like it works, it works both to its advantage and its disadvantage. Um because this is a trope that creates um, a very a, a repeated notion of people not knowing and not figuring stuff out until long after we the reader have already figured it out so it sort of feels like the characters are maybe 10 steps behind the reader a lot of the time um, and then there are other things going on too now um, I talked about before um, how uh, there are characters in this that I sort of felt um, sort of had echoes in uh, the show uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And uh, the biggest one for me is uh, the character Silk. Um, he, has this, he has this incredibly like confident attitude about all the shady deals he does. And, and I remember reading this book and thinking... Silk is almost exactly like Garak from uh, Deep Space Nine. Like, this guy who has this very secret, unknown past. He's done a lot of shady deals. And so whenever anybody calls him on it, he's always like, oh, yeah, well, I'm just that shady kind of guy. Um, and I really like that about him. Uh, I, thought, I thought Silk was a really fun character. Um, uh, I loved, like, I love, like, his responses to to lots of uh, accusations, like um, is that 
Temple is saying Silk is one of the more interesting characters. Um, yeah, because he's not like he's not your typical gig guy. Like he seems like the kind of person who initially is just sort of like a shyster who is along for the ride. But as you as you learn more about him and you start to meet more of the royalty, you realize that like he actually does have like these strong royal ties to uh, the kingdom of uh, Drasnia. Like he's actually a prince. Um, but he's also part of this covert spy network. Um, Temple is saying, I thought the relationship, his relationship to the queen was interesting and you can't remember her name. I think it was Queen Porin. Uh, it, I understand there are a lot of characters in this for, you know, such a, such a thin book. It's only about 300 pages, but like we, we meet a lot of different characters in this book <laughs> and we, we meet more characters, uh, later on. Uh, yes, I believe, I believe, uh, the queen's name is, uh, is Porin, possibly. I don't know. I'm pretty sure though. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like I said, there's a lot of different characters in this, um, and there are more to come even in later books. Like, uh, in, in the next book, we meet, uh, the woman that Garion is supposed to marry, and she's a fascinating character whose, whose name I can't remember, but she's a, she's a, a wonderful character. She is, uh, she's a lot like, uh, Aunt Paul which I really like. Um, so this was, uh, this was Pawn of Prophecy. I thought it was a, a th I think it's a really strong um, uh, start to what ends up being a really good series that has a truly, a truly satisfying payoff. Like I was talking earlier about how, um, uh, Harry Potter uh, and the Deathly Hallows didn't really have uh, as strong a payoff as I was hoping it would. Um, this series does. This series has um, a fantastic climax. Um, everything gets tied together. Um, it, this is a very good uh, story for that sort of... This is a very good quest story. It's a very good character exploration. Um, so I would uh, I would recommend, even though we're probably not going to do uh, the later books in the series as uh, books of the month here, um, on your own time, I would recommend reading the rest of the series because I feel like uh, it pays off very well in the end, and it's a really good journey. Uh, it's a really fun journey. Um, there are certain things like it take it takes a while for Garion to finally like fully come into his own and stop being the uh, the petulant and confused little kid, but you know that's that's part of his character arc. That's part of who he is. Um, one of the things that they talk about a lot is uh, the uh, the futility of asking the question "Why me." Um, <laughs> Jan is saying, you are wrong. Everything about Harry Potter is awesome. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, that's uh, that's totally fair, Jan. Uh, uh, I, I, I enjoy Harry Potter fine. Uh, so, um... So yeah, I would recommend uh, if you if you have the time and you have the inclination, uh, read the rest of the series. Um, I think you'll be uh, um, Light of the King is saying it is only what nine nine years, ten years old. I'm I'm assuming you're talk. Are you talking about a uh, Garion? Because I think Garion's a bit older than that. I think he's probably about fourteen in uh in this book. So, um, so yes, um, yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, Light of the King is saying, yeah, I mean, Gary and his nine or ten. Yeah, I think, I, I feel like somewhere in the book it says that he's like 14 in this book, um, 
because it, it starts out he's a little kid but then we sort of flash forward uh a number of years to when um when uh the uh when Belgarath comes back and uh we have the attack and everybody is forced to leave uh Faldor's farm so so yeah that okay temple is uh is agreeing with me there so okay good that I, I wasn't misreading that um so yeah i mean he's a he's a 14 year old kid he's gonna be uh he's gonna be very petulant he's gonna be very why me um but there he gets a lot of uh a lot of lectures about the uh, the futility of that question why me um because it's it's really like all you're doing is whining at that point um and and not doing the right thing which is to accept your destiny um but again like that can that can be kind of argued like well what if you don't accept your destiny uh and but in garion's case if he doesn't accept his destiny then torak comes back and the world gets destroyed so you know there is that um so um as for uh february uh our book of the month uh i had to uh think about this one for a little while because i wasn't sure where we wanted to go uh this is of course torn book club which means uh there are we could read another tolkien book uh so far we've uh so far we've just read uh the father christmas letters um and i do want to do more tolkien books uh as uh, the book of the month um, but I also have to keep in mind that we have something of a limited pool to, uh, to choose from as far as, uh, Tolkien books go, so I don't want to do too many too soon. So, then the other one was, uh, well, it's February, it's Valentine's, so maybe some kind of, uh, romantic story. And I thought, I really don't know that many, uh, that many romantic uh sci-fi or fantasy stories that aren't written by stephanie meyer and i'm not going to subject anybody to her garbage um temple is asking at some point will we be able to suggest or maybe vote on books we will read um lady the king is saying i'm in the middle of the silmarillion taking a while but it is fascinating it is uh the Silmarillion is a very fascinating book, but yeah, it takes a while to get through it. Um, uh, Temple is a asked if uh, we could suggest or maybe vote on books to read. Um, I, I would like to do that at some point. Um, uh, yes, there is the romantic, like uh, King Arthur. <laughs> um, and I, I was thinking about uh, some, uh, some Arthurian stories. Um, so so there is of course um the we can do an arthurian story and tolkien which is romance and tolkien together with uh the latest one uh the fall of arthur which is tolkien's uh uncompleted uh epic poem about king arthur um uh and when you were th and when you were through reread it so it sticks uh what is that cap sinapa is saying that i'm assuming you're talking about uh the silmarillion uh yeah the silmarillion is one that you sort of need to uh go through a couple of times so um so the decision for uh february um will we're gonna go with uh, the Fall of Arthur by by J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, this is one I haven't read, um, so it's a it's a new discovery for me too. Um, I love Arthurian legend, um, and I know that this one is uh, dealing more with uh, with the original story and not um, the version that uh, Thomas Mallory uh, put together, which is sort of the more readily accepted legend of king arthur that we know today but it would be interesting to see like some of the uh the different ideas in um 
in a Arthurian legend that that existed. So so yeah, the book for uh, February is going to be uh, the Fall of Arthur. Uh, yes, Temple is saying there was a, there was a recent reprint of the book, so it should be easy to find. It should be, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I know there isn't an audible version of it because I've looked for it, but I'm pretty sure there's a Kindle version of it at least. So, but that should be a that should be a good read for everybody. Um, Uh, Light of the King is saying just watched uh, the uh, the movie King Arthur with uh, Clive Owen and Ian Griffith. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I know they like to say that that one is supposed to be more historically accurate, but not sure I totally buy that too much. Um, So, so uh, that that will bring us to uh, the end of uh, today's program. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for uh, for coming in and stopping by and uh, doing all the uh, doing all the fun chat and uh, and. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, enjoy your uh, enjoy the the big game if you're going to be watching it. Um, enjoy uh, enjoy the wonderful uh, Groundhog Day. Enjoy uh, uh, Chinese New Year. There's a lot going on this weekend. Chinese New Year, Groundhog Day, Super Bowl, and this. <laughs> Although this is just a, a fun, silly little distraction from the rest of the day. Um, so, um, so, uh, if you, uh, maybe for next time we can have some tech info for Justin TV. Um, it, if we can, like, I'm, I'm gonna try to figure some stuff out on my own. Uh, so, um. So yeah, uh, if you uh, if you missed uh, if you missed the show uh, today, we are going to be um, I'm going to put up uh, the archive of the show up on our uh, our um, our YouTube channel uh, later today, uh, so you can check our Facebook page for that when it goes up. Uh, this is this is a pretty uh, this is a pretty uh, weird episode for the most part, but hey, it that's what happens. Uh, when figuring out all these uh, technical glitches. Hopefully uh, next time we'll go uh, a lot smoother. So uh, yes, the next uh, episode will be in two weeks. Um, so that would make it the 16th. Yes, uh, the 16th of uh, February. So uh, right after uh, Valentine's Day. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, That'll bring us uh, to the end of this one. And I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank um, I want to thank Jan and Light of the King and Temple for all of their uh, all their input and for the chat. Um, Light of the King is saying uh, on the 16th I will be at Scott Fest at the Queen Mary. So I may miss you, but I will watch the archive. Well, that's good. So, um, yes, we'll bring this to a close. Thank you all so much for, uh, for stopping by and chatting about Harry Potter and about Pawn of Prophecy and about, um, and about Tolkien and all of this, uh, wonderful fun stuff that we do every week. So, um. Uh, Jan is asking, have you decided the subject for future shows, or can we write emails with suggestions? Um, you can absolutely uh, email me with suggestions for uh, future shows. Um, you 
don't have to worry about that at all. Please, please do uh, email me any suggestions that you have for future shows. Um, I I try to pre-plan this stuff, but that doesn't mean like I can't put an idea into the queue for later on. So, um, so that brings us to the end here. Uh, let me just uh, bring up our contact information as we end and. Thank you all again so much for uh, stopping by. I will see you in two weeks and never stop reading.